Well, how many of you saw Leonard when he was here last week? Yes? Oh, not that many, eh? I thought a Zoomer audience like you, you'd have been all over it. In any case, that's Leonard speculating about how it all comes to an end. And in order to kick this uh, meeting off in high style, I thought we'd begin with calamities. I mean, doesn't it always come down to this? Uh, are things getting better or are they getting worse? Can we find a reason to sustain happiness in the face of the facts? I mean, however, we here may be healthy and wealthy and talented and good-looking. Pertold Brecht used to say, the man who is laughing has not yet heard the bad news. <laughs> Here are just some of the predations out there that could put a serious dent in our oh-so-comfortable lives. Food prices spiral out of control and then food runs out. Water runs out. Oil runs out. A global pandemic which I'm told we're actually statistically overdue for, and then finally culminating in the granddaddy of all calamities, the one that could actually wipe all six and a half billion of us out at a single stroke, and that's the near-Earth object. So, the way our language works, we usually say food and drink, and I thought at one point that we begin with a discussion of the situation in food, but then I thought, wait a minute, we are, in our own composition, made up of 70%, 80% water, the planet is 70 or 80% water, maybe we should begin with water. So our first speaker will be Chris Wood. He's got a book out, it's available upstairs in the bookstore up on the mezzanine, it's called Dry Spring, The Coming Water Crisis in which he tells us how global warming will melt our glaciers, empty the Great Lakes, force the United States to buy water from us. Happy days to start. It's happy thoughts to start your day. I'm sorry, here's Chris. Days to start. Happy thoughts to start your day. I'm sorry, here's Chris. So many people out here at this, uh, this hour of the morning to, uh, to catch the opening, opening set. And I want to thank Moses for creating this event because this is just so cool. You know, for an idea junkie like me, this is pig heaven. You know, it really truly is. But you know, it's something else that I think we ought to remember. It's what private enterprise can do creatively to build our personal capital, our human capital, our collective social capital. Yeah, and I gotta hope a little bit of Moses' private capital. You know, that would be nice too. I'd like you to hold on to that idea. But you know, when you, when you bat, well, second in a lineup like this with so many interesting, fascinating ideas to come from this podium, it's kind of humbling. So I thought I would start with a humble proposal. I think the idea that I'm going to talk about in the next few minutes is going to come to define the 21st century the way the spread of democracy defined the 20th century. But you know, they, they describe me in the program as a peak water specialist, and that's actually kind of neat because it plays two ways. You know, as Moses implied, it, it, it plays off that notion of peak oil. The idea that we've got as much now as we're ever going to have, it's all downhill from here. We're going to see increasing competition for dwindling supplies, inevitable conflict, wars over water. And all of that could happen. But, you know, there's another sense to it. It's, it's the sense that you get when you're standing behind the levee and you're watching the water rise and you're wondering, has the flood peaked yet? Now that's the question they're asking themselves down in the Midwest. And, and that's the deal. We're getting both too little water and too much water. Now that's the sneaky thing about climate change that I learned in, in the course of writing Dry Spring. It's not always what you expect. 
we think of it as, as increasing heat, but the thing is that heat drives everything else in the weather train. Heat is what is the fuel that pushes the weather around. So when you get more heat, you get more of everything else except predictability. You get more powerful winds, you get bigger storms, you get more torrential downpours, and you get longer, deeper, hotter droughts. You get more extremes. All the extremes amp up so that wet places become wetter, dry places become drier. It's kind of a, it's kind of a rich get richer scenario and the poor get poorer. Wet seasons become wetter. Winter becomes wetter. Summer becomes drier. You get the unexpected. Stuff moves around. We're actually seeing the tropics expand on either side of the equator. They're pushing the temperate zones north and south. And they're pushing water towards the poles. It's one of the reasons the United States, particularly the southern United States, is getting drier. And Canada is getting wetter on average. Precipitation over the Arctic up 11% in, in the last 50 years. You get the unexpected. Anybody here remember last winter's winter? Yeah, I thought maybe. You know, people wrote about that like global warming had gone into reverse. They hadn't read the science. Here's what was going on. No ice on the Great Lakes. The Great Lakes didn't freeze. They used to. They don't anymore. When there's no ice on the Great Lakes, there's nothing holding the water in during the winter. There's no cap on the Great Lakes. So you get these great blasts of dry Arctic air come blowing down. They blow across Lake Superior. They blow across Lake Huron. They blow across Lake Michigan. And they suck them up like a vacuum cleaner. They take that moist air, generally blows east over Ontario and Quebec. The land does cool faster than the water. And all of a sudden, You've got snow breaking down roofs in Quebec because of climate change. You get other kinds of invisible effects from evaporation. Evaporation pulls water out of the soils, out of plants, out of rivers and lakes. There's less water in those rivers to dilute our waste, to dilute the nutrients that flow off, off of farmers' fields. You get a toxic soup flowing into lakes and estuaries. You get dead zones in Lake Erie in Lake Winnipeg, in the Gulf of St. Lawrence, in the Gulf of Mexico. I wish I could say that was the calamity. That's not the calamity, that's the setup. Here's the real calamity. We're spinning around the sun in a spaceship with a life support system that is crashing. The Millennium Ecosystem Assessment called this, in fact, a more urgent problem than climate change. Two-thirds of our life support systems on this planet are running down. Those are the natural ecosystems that produce our air, clean our water, give us food, whether it's farmed food or wild food. Two-thirds of them are running down. We're in ecological overdraft. The globe produces only so much of these ecosystem services every year. We run through that income by the end of September. And we're running through it faster and faster every year, partly because we're using more, also because we're destroying the systems that produce it. And, you know, we're seeing this in a variety of, of ways. We see it with groundwater mining. Uh, the, the main grain-producing areas in China and India depend fundamentally on pumped groundwater that's being pulled out of the ground much faster than it can be replenished. The World Business Council on Sustainable Development just recently estimated that China's economic miracle, really, could come grinding to a halt because of water crises as early as 2015. India won't be far behind. Scientists are beginning to talk about a sixth great extinction. And folks, we're candidates. And, you know, this part really should scare us. It's all happening faster and sooner than we thought it was going to, faster and sooner than scientists just five years ago believed it would. The North Pole has been covered in ice for tens of millennia. A few years ago, they said it could be ice-free by 2050. Then it was 2040. Then it was 2030. I was down in Washington last week, and I heard one of America's leading climate scientists say, 
The new ETA for an open Arctic is 2013. That's five years from now. That fellow was John Holdren. He's the director of the Woods Hole Research Center. And he said, we basically have three choices. He was talking about climate change, but it, it tracks. We can mitigate, we can adapt, or we can suffer. Well, mitigation basically means changing what we do so that we get less climate change. Adaptation means changing what we do so we cope with climate change. So basically, our choices here are two. We change or we suffer. And really, what, you know, what's up for grabs is the mix. And it all comes back to water. You know, we, we say water is life, and of course, water is life. But life is also water. We depend on life. We depend on our wetlands, our rivers, to metabolize our waste, to deliver our water, to buffer the ups and downs of, of weather. If we trash nature, we also trash our water. And of course, water connects with all these other crises. It connects with ocean viruses. It connects with pandemics. It connects with the food crisis. And you know, in fact, one small correction for Moses, we're not actually running out of water. We're defrosting a whole lot more of it. We've got lots of water. Our problem is that we're budgeting it badly and we're dirtying it up. We are, however, running out of nature. The thing is, if we get the water part right, we'll get the nature part right because we can't get water right without getting nature right, and we have a chance to get the rest of it right. If we screw up water, well, we probably are the sixth extinction. So where did we go wrong? I mean, we've been following the very best economic navigation. Let me say that again. Where did we go wrong? We've been following the very best economic navigation. Well, it turns out that bean counting, as usual, has, in a prospectus, they'd call it material omissions. You know? The metrics, gross national product, generally accepted accounting principles, they leave stuff out. They leave out human capital. They don't take account of social capital, the kind of social capital that makes an event like this possible. I mean, try this in Zimbabwe, you know, or Baghdad. Even with a Moses Nimer, it's not going to happen. But the most important kind of capital that our conventional accounting leaves out is natural capital. And because it hasn't been valued, and it hasn't been priced, yes, we waste it. But even worse, we underinvest in it. And you know what happens to capital that you don't take care of? It wears out. It runs down. That's what's happening to our natural capital. And that's what we have to start getting, getting right. But you know, there's good news here, too. The economic fundamentals have shifted. It used to be there was lots of nature. You, know, you cut down this forest, go over the hill, there's another forest. You tap out this oil field, there's another oil field. Nature was plentiful, there was no point in putting a price on it. It made sense to keep it as a public commons with open access. Well, guess what? We're getting scarcity. Oh boy, are we getting scarcity. And of course, scarcity creates tensions, it creates conflicts and the potential for, for violence. But scarcity also creates something else. It creates the opportunity for markets. And if it's a choice between markets and war to sort this stuff out, I'm going with markets. Thank you very much. Another change is happening to the thinking of environmentalists. Environmental thinking used to be all about segregation. Nature over here in sanctuaries and preserves and parks the rest of the economy over there, never the twain shall meet. Well, this has patently, obviously, not worked. We're running out of nature. Do you know what percentage of our biodiversity in this world will be preserved in parks and protected areas, even including the ones that only exist on paper? Five. Five percent. Twenty-first century environmentalists are recognizing you can't segregate nature from the conventional economy. You have to reintegrate them. We have to put a price on nature and get nature into the price tag of everything. And that's the idea that's going to define the 21st century. Thank you all for coming out. Thank you for your attention. Lots of great ideas to come.
Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate you picking it up.